welcome to episode 176 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I am here with... Andrew Swafford. Lydia Creech. Nathan Smith. In today's episode, we will be talking about movies we saw this week in part one, and in part two, we will be doing the second part of our first-time favorites from 2017. These are not 2017 releases, but movies that we saw for the first time this year and really want to uh, shed a spotlight on. Um, but let's go ahead and get into movies that we saw this week. Our first one is is one that's been getting a lot of chatter since it debuted on the festival circuit. Uh, it's been racking up some critics awards, and it's one that uh, probably will be talked about more as we get toward the Oscar season. It is Call Me By Your Name, the latest from director Luca Guadagnino, uh, and it's based on the book by Andre Ackerman. And it stars Army Hammer, Timothy Chalamet, and Michael Stuhlbarg, and, and follows this the uh, 17-year-old Elio uh, in northern Italy in 1983, who begins a relationship with Oliver, the visiting research assistant of his father, uh, who he begins to bond with, uh, with uh, over his emerging sexuality, their Jewish heritage, and the beguiling Italian landscape. Um, Nathan, you caught this this week. I, I talked about it a, a, a month or so ago when I caught it at the Savannah Film Festival, but I'm curious to see, hear your take on it because you seem um, much more pro Call Me By Your Name than I was. Yeah, it's definitely one of my favorites of the year so far. Um, I was a big... I did not see uh, Luca's last film, A Bigger Splash, but I really love his movie, I Am Love, with Tilda Swinton. I think that... Both that movie and Call Me By Your Name have a very kind of sensual uh, quality. They're both uh, very much about the landscape, about the space in which they take place, kind of the, the pleasures of, of the senses and the food and all those nice things. Um, I think what really struck me most about this movie is the, um, the, the, the cinematography, which is by... I'm gonna butcher this name because Thai names are really difficult but it's by uh, Sambu uh, Mukdipram who is probably most well known for doing the cinematography for uh, Pidget Pong or Sethakul's Uncle Boon Me who can recall his past lives. He also did the cinematography for uh, Miguel Gomez's Arabian Nights which was one of my favorite movies of 2015 and it was shot on 35 millimeter film and really has uh, because of that a really kind of nice texture and, and quality to it and I mean, there are there are actually moments on this movie where I it takes place in the '80s, um, and unlike a lot of movies made now that take place in the '80s, it's not necessarily a nostalgia trip, even though it's very much in dialogue or at least using the culture of that time. It's not just you know referencing things. Elio wears a talking head shirt, but it's not like oh look, he's wearing a talking head shirt. It's the '80s, guys. It's just like it really. Does there there are there are scenes that I I'm just looking at and I'm like this doesn't look like a movie from 2017 and I also think kind of beyond the the photographic qualities of it part of the reason why is because the screenplay is by James Ivory of the duo Merchant Ivory, um, you know who did all of those kind of all of the movies to me that like when I was younger were like grown up movies like uh, the remains of the day and all this just very kind of like British. Uh, romances um, and so it very much has that quality maybe a little bit more erotic than those movies but it still very much has that kind of like literary quality to it and I think one of the things that really appealed to me to it is just being somebody who's like my dad has, for my whole life worked in, in universities and been an academic it has that just kind of like quality of like you're in this just like historic place surrounded by books and learning and knowledge and you're just in that, that world. And one of the things which I haven't really seen people talk about this in writing about this film is the sense of history that it has, which is very informed by the Italian landscape. And it's not a huge focus of the film, but like Elio and Oliver will be riding their bikes in the city square and they'll see this monument dedicated to the soldiers of World War I and they'll have like a very brief conversation about it or they'll stop at the home of an old woman and she still, even in the 1980s, has a portrait of Mussolini hanging up. And so there's just these kind of little details about the history of the, the place where it's set just sort of jutting out. Um, and I felt like that sort of reflected the, the state of the, the characters. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about it, even though I've seen criticisms of it saying that it's not 
doesn't go as far as the novel or isn't as explicit of the novel, but I really don't feel like we see a lot of depictions of bisexuality or male bisexuality in movies. And this movie doesn't really come down like on either side of like, oh, you know, these characters are gay. You know, it's, it's not like explicitly s describing them as bi, but it kind of leaves their sexuality more open. Both Elio and Oliver have relationships with men and women, and they're not clearly like in one direction or the other. And so kind of like these, like the, the, the place they have these experiences, they kind of may repress those experiences. I think one of the best moments in the movie is when Elio has a conversation with his dad who sort of admits to kind of his own past of like feeling attraction towards men, but just ultimately repressing it and never acting on it. Um, and so you have these characters who have these desires and these urges and maybe they explore them, maybe they repress them, but those things never really go away. It's sort of like the history of a place. I mean, buildings can erode or be bulldozed, but that the effects of history never really go away. Um, and that was something that I just really liked about this movie that it's just this like very, um, it really just, it's, it just feels like both emotionally and, and in terms of texture um, and, and place and it also just has like the most amazing like opening and closing credit sequences that I've seen in a long time yeah the the, the closing credits of, of, of the movie is just really you, you just need to kind of sit there and, and just kind of simmer in it because yeah it's just it's very movie it's like I, I was reminded a lot by the closing credits of uh, Good Time where the credits are rolling but the movie is still going and there's a really fucking devastatingly emotional song playing and like <laughs> even though you feel like you you're supposed to leave because it's the credits you stay there and you watch until the end and it's just like heartbreaking i mean T timothy chalamet is just like amazing in this and i think it's really fascinating how his character in this is sort of like just the same character he played in ladybird but like look through a different lens like you know this kind of like bookish cool guy but in ladybird he was just like a complete jackass and in this movie you kind of find the like emotional complexity and also not to mention that everybody in this movie like both men and women are really hot uh and i felt a little bit like i'm too ugly to watch this movie just like everybody's dressed really well and just like the soundtrack like you have original songs by sufjan stevens which as with every sufjan song are just like take all of the feeling out of you but you also have like the great use of the psychedelic furs and um John Adams music like in I Am Love and like just and some great like Italian music that I had never heard before from the 80s um, so this is a movie that has just been like sitting with me and it's like takes a lot out of you but it's just like such a rewarding sensory experience um, it's not playing like super wide right now but I assume because of kind of the buzz around it and the awards that it will go wider so I think this is a movie that people are going to love and going to talk about more and more so definitely when it comes to your place, go see it. Yeah. No, I, 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 I second everything that you said. It's, I think it's, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm really excited to catch it again. I think that, um, I, I, I kind of will be much more willing to kind of, I think that with this movie, you, you kind of have to be willing to just let it, let all the lushness of it just like, hit you like a wave and just kind of envelop you um because it, it is it's so it's so beautiful it's so radiant and just not even just the people just like the scenery you know it just uh it's just so, it's there's so much going on all around that's kind of subtle it's 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 a lot to take in so i'm really excited to get a second viewing um yeah it's in, it is in theaters now uh our next film is another 2017 release it is Lady Macbeth. Um, Andrew, I, I, I'll let you and Lydia explain the plot of this one. I'm going to pass this off to Lydia because we have not heard enough from her. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Lady Macbeth, it was directed by William Oldroy. It stars... Um, Florence Pugh. Who was in The Falling. The Falling. She's so good in The Falling. And she plays the... T no no not titular <laughs> no one in this movie's name is lady Macbeth. Oh. <laughs> she plays the main character named Catherine, and it opens up and you see her getting married and it kind of turns out it's 
uh, like an arranged marriage, marriage of convenience. It's Victorian England. The, yeah. the Moors. It yeah. It's windy. And the movie starts out garnering a lot of sympathy for her character. Uh, you know, loveless marriage, uh, overbearing father-in-law, it's just very she's very isolated boredom uh yeah. but then it slowly starts introducing elements that complicate yeah <laughs> i guess our moral allegiance mm-hmm. with her uh she starts having an affair with a uh, groomsman and um I don't know how to describe really where it goes from there. It's probably Uh, best to not describe where it goes from there. This movie takes some fairly unexpected turns, even though I think that you hear the plot synopsis or watch the trailer and you feel like you know exactly what this movie is going to be. But it, I I was not ready for what this was. Complications start arising in the way she responds to them. (laughs) Uh, Slowly get more extreme. Yeah. But not in like a hysterical woman way. She's ice cold. The title, I think, uh, Shakespeare, Lady Macbeth, kind of the the way women who really really have no options. Uh, Victorian England um, trapped in a marriage. Uh, kind of like Marie Antoinette. By Sofia Coppola. Mm. If you think about it that way. Like, what if she just behaved very badly? <laughs> uh, I mean, not that she doesn't in that movie, but. Uh. So I think I really enjoyed it. I watched it with Andrew and Jesse, and we were talking about it afterwards. And Jesse's like, I gave it four stars, and Andrew gave it four stars, but for wildly different reasons. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I guess if I gave things stars, I'd give it four. Yeah, Jesse was very invested in the romance in the center of the movie, and I think that the the film really works hard to make you invested in the romance of the movie, and then like punishes you for being invested in the romance um, in a way that, again, I was very surprised by, and I thought was very bold. I mean, there's a lot that we can talk about in terms of like the cinema of this movie, the framing and the sound design, like it's all very beautifully crafted despite the fact that this director comes from theater. Uh, This feels very cinematic. But, you know, as film criticism kind of feels more and more like political op-eds every day, it's been a really long time since I've seen a movie with politics as surprising and bold as this movie. And not in a, like, let's play both sides kind of like... um, false equivalents, like MRA style, like let's complicate the way you look at female sexuality sort of thing. Like it take it takes a very uh, incisive and in-depth look at history and uh, how... Systems of power. Systems like of power. types of privilege. And it does all this in the form of a, like a costume drama where you would expect to go to a movie like this to get like very comforting truisms or or just validating your own perspective on history and your own perspective on you know whatever historical politics you're looking at but man this is a kind of a rough watch in in that respect um you do you do not know how to feel at the end of lady macbeth um but ultimately i think that what it's doing is really smart as opposed to waffling yes um it <laughs> It, it knows what a 2017 audience walking in wants from this narrative, and uh, it gives it to them, but it also asks them to look deeper at what it is that they want, um, or like what it is they're leaving out of their understanding of history. But we should also talk about the like cinema stuff going on here, because there's a lot of it. Um, it's set in the Moors in England, and so there's like a great whooshing sound design when and she's like outside. The house is very old and floors creak and shutters. 
you you get a great sense of space within the house like you can hear things happening on the other side of the house at all times and the deadly silence when uh, there's nobody there other than Catherine and she just can't hear anything but the ticking of the clock and she's incredibly like soul crushingly bored um, and there's so much visual storytelling like very very little dialogue in Lady Macbeth um, only what is absolutely necessary to the, move the plot along. Yeah, the framing and where the characters are placed in relation, like a lot of it's set around dinner tables mm-hmm. and just like the head of the family and then Catherine off to one side and, or she gets up and goes to the other side of the room. Putting windows in like very purposeful locations in the frame to really make the characters feel boxed in. Um, it reminded me in a way of Raise the Red Lantern by Zhang Yumao, which is not a movie we've talked about on the podcast, but an incredible like Chinese melodrama thriller thing <laughs> that you should definitely check out if you can. Uh, but it does similar things with the way that it uses like geography and architecture to make people feel uh, trapped and to withhold certain information from the audience. Or imply uh, relationships between yeah. characters. Oh, it's, this is really, really well done. I, I, was, I knew that I would like it, um, but I was not ready for like what I would like about it and for it to be as like cinema as it is, you know, like I, I kind of thought this would be just, I don't know, uh, a passable, but good, um, costume drama. But it's, it's more than that for sure. Um, uh, people should check this out. Uh, it is on, and your in your red box machines, at your local Kroger or Walgreens <laughs> if you want to seek it out there. L- any final thoughts from you, Lydia? I uh, just want to praise the... What's her name again? Uh, Florence Pugh. You know, Florence Pugh's performance. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't flinch, I'm no. going to say, from her, the role that she's been tasked with at all. Uh <laughs> I don't know, like, usually you, you want to watch a movie and, like, see a character evolve or, like, grow and learn something about themselves, and I don't necessarily think she does this. No. But the, but we are asked to change how we're relating to her. I'm going to give a minor and obscure spoiler to exemplify how much Florence Pugh d- does not flinch in this movie, which is she, at one point she's having an affair... And the person she's having an affair with is hidden in the closet because the, her person, <laughs> the person who doesn't need to find out has come home. Uh, and he questions her about this, and she pulls the guy out of the closet and starts fucking him. While with, maintaining eye I contact with this other person. It's such a goddamn power move. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, yeah, you don't, you're not ready for this movie. Just watch it. It's yeah, good. Just, yeah. um, Let's talk about the other, uh, like, weirdly intense movie we watched this morning, uh, Brawl in Cell Block 99 by S. Craig Zoller, uh, the director of Bone Tomahawk, uh, Bone Tomahawk and also the author of many uh, Amazon reviews of board games that you can find if you Google for that. And, like, actual published. Oh, really? Yeah. Like I didn't a, know that. Yeah, oh. an actual writer. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in a band, like a metal what? band, too, I think. What? Yeah. Okay. Anyways, Lydia, <laughs> tell people what Brawl and Cell Block 99 is about. I think Brawl and Cell Block 99 has been getting a lot of attention for the central performance by Vince Vaughn, who plays a family man. At the beginning of the film, he gets laid off, like a string of bad luck. His wife's been having an affair, and they decide to work it out. But in order to make money, he becomes a drug runner. Mm-hmm. And seems like gets his life back on track great but then a deal goes badly and he's sent to prison and we lead up to the titular brawl in cell block 99 <laughs> uh and vince Vaughn is actually very very good he freaks yeah. me the fuck out uh, <laughs> just as an actor but that works in this role because he's like has a very strong moral compass is one of the yeah he's other... not a gross turd face like he is in most movies <laughs> uh, uh you know i lost my train of thought uh you said he had a strong moral compass it's like a strong moral compass like cares very deeply about his family and so we're the audience kind of like lady Macbeth, set up to be pretty sympathetic towards he, him he's shown at the beginning to be like very economically 
disadvantaged and kind of at a dead end with how he is to achieve the American dream. There's like a lot of American flags yeah. in this movie. <laughs> um, and it's very much about like what what someone who is kind of at the end of their rope financially will do to just survive. Um, and the movie is almost two and a half hours long and it is an, like an odyssey for this character. Like you really feel like you have lived with him for a very, very long time. Um, and like Lady Macbeth, it is a movie that has a very complicated relationship to its protagonist and messes with your sympathies for this guy. Yeah. It does a, a very John Wick type thing at the beginning where it absolutely grants you like uh, empathy with the character. Uh, you have like moral justification for the violence that is going to follow. Uh, it, it's pulling at your heartstrings in some, some very uh, sincere ways. And then that kind of allows the movie to become this like violent, pulpy genre romp. But I mean, it goes way further I mean, than like John Wick does. That scene in Bone Tomahawk that everybody talked about is just like similar levels of over the body top mutilation, shit, violence. Yeah. Uh, he likes ripping limbs apart, just um, snapping arms the wrong way. Yeah, several times. So it's I. I think all of us who watched it felt very conflicted towards this movie. Um, I, yeah, I thought it was uh, slow. Okay, we've been talking, he likes kind of paying homage to these pulpy genre films, but unlike pulpy genre exploitation B films, it's like dives in really slowly and like sets this kind of very deliberate pace and stretches it out. Two hours Very in. like patient formal camera work. Uh, it's like this smooth, glossy digital, like uh, elevating yeah. the genre sort of thing. Like, I don't think he's trying to make a quote unquote respectable action movie. I know you hate the respectable action genre, Nathan. I don't think he's trying <laughs> to do that. I think he's trying to filter the exploitation grindhouse genre through his own lens. And after watching this and Bone Tomahawk, I definitely get the sense that he has an auteurist style um but now i don't know if i like that auteurist <laughs> style. like i enjoyed bone tomahawk as this weird genre mashup um and when it takes a turn it's like oh that's pretty cool and it I takes guess. a turn very very late and this movie is kind of merciless throughout um like it doesn't have an act of violence as horrific as what happens at the end of bone tomahawk but as a lot of smaller ones peppered all throughout and it, it becomes a bit of an endurance test after a point of like, yes, you have this moral justification for why what is happening on screen is happening, but do you really want to watch it happen in this like very slow, methodical, two and a half hour uh, like doling out of arms being ripped off and bones being yeah. shattered and things like that? Um, so it's a, <laughs> a, a case of like really well done craft but uh, not necessarily being a pleasant watch. Um, what, what else do you got, Lydia? Other thoughts on this? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I watched it this morning, and I already think I'm going to forget it soon. Why did you guys watch it this morning? That seems like a, a, just a rough thing to wake up to. We were going to go to the gym afterwards. We're going to get pumped up. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the one like unequivocally great thing about the movie is Vince Vaughn. And again, I was not expecting Vince Vaughn to be as great as he is in this movie, but he's very grounded, very believable and playing a role that you have not seen him play before. Um, so I hope he continues to explore, you know, his range as an actor. Cause he hasn't really been, I don't know, necessarily granted the opportunity is the right word, really but he hasn't, them. yeah, he hasn't pushed himself as much until this. Um, I don't. <laughs> Fred Claus was pretty challenging, so Fred Claus. <laughs> um, yeah, and we will uh, see him continue to challenge himself in S. Craig Zoller's next movie. Oh yeah, a, uh, riveting look at police brutality with uh, known uh, Hollywood. You know, there are just so few conservatives in Hollywood. You know, but Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn. 
They're, they're speaking truth to power. Conservative is one word for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say it's kind of a conservative movie, too. Uh, like really, Sprawl and Cell Block? Sprawl, sprawl why, and Cell Block. Why would you say that? I mean, when you think about what movies are saying ideologically, just underline it. It's like with the American flags everywhere and like very family values and justifiable violence. Because I don't actually think that, like, it complicates its relationship with the protagonist, but again, like, with these extreme acts of violence, and they're really cool, and I know they made a big deal about doing all of the effects practically, mm-hmm. uh, like, with prosthetics yeah. and squibs. Like, it looks cool if you're into that, and so you're not, a- okay, not so necessarily two... a cr- criticism, and that's yeah. a little bit of a conservative two things like individualistic one is another way i think this is different than john wick is that once john wick once you buy into okay i'm gonna watch this guy massacre a bunch of people like john wick rebels rebels in the fun and the cool factor of like watching this propulsive action film and i don't think brawl and stuff like 99 is like a fun movie to watch like even if you are this like macho movie fan who really likes watching like the punisher and stuff like that like i don't i don't think there's a lot of joy or like fist bump moments to be found but that's here. the kind of movie um, mel gibson makes too like yeah it's fucking grueling but at the mm. same time it's like there's he admires it yeah yeah and i'm maybe thinking and it is i mean that is a good point because mel gibson does have those like family like hacksaw ridge is like this weird like very like Christian melodrama, but it has yeah. this like basically like the violence of a Fulci movie like yeah. s- stuck onto it. And the other thing that I was gonna say is that uh, the way the movie treats the prison system is not necessarily something that oh I would call God. conservative <laughs> either. I mean, you kind of get different looks at it because the movie is so long. It it allows itself to spend a lot of time in a very realistic procedural it's prison like, oh, that setting. That seems like how prisons are run. And it's still terrible, right? Um, and very uh, inhumane in ways. Um, but then at a certain point, the movie enters movie land and it brings you to a like Dante's Inferno style prison. <laughs> like uh, chains on the walls and torture devices. Broken glass on the floor and stuff like that. <laughs> but whether you're looking at the realistic depiction of prison or the movie land version of prison, both are not the like place of of reforming good civilians. That's not what conservatives that, want. What do you think? It's how, a place why, of punishment. Like, we're, we don't reform our criminals in America. Mm-hmm. We just put them away where we don't have to deal with them and people can make money off of them. And I don't know... I mean, that's the backdrop of the this movie, but I don't think that was necessarily criticized that much. I mean, there's a little speech that Vince Vaughn gives where he talks about how uh, he knows that... Um, Running drugs gets you a worse punishment than, you know, And being... then he takes it very stoically, like... But the, the point, for people who have not seen the movie, is he makes a speech saying that running drugs gets you a harsher sentence than if you are to beat up your wife or child. And at that moment in the movie, we are unequivocally on his side morally. So, like, he is giving voice to this criticism of the justice system... And then there's like two full hours of the justice system being terrible. So I think it's maybe more complicated than just this is a conservative movie. But I um, do think that's a little bit underneath I, it. I, yeah. That whole individual can bootstraps even if he gets punished for it. Even if it's like a tragic story. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Whew. It, it, yeah. It's... A thing to be reckoned with, I think. Um, I cannot guarantee that people will like it. I don't know if I like it. I don't know if I'm going to see S. Craig Zoller's next film. But uh, <laughs> and the I, name of that movie is like I can't remember the exact title, but it's like Dragged Across Concrete or something like uh, that. Well, there's a part where somebody's face, face gets dragged across concrete in this movie. Yeah. It's uh, so if you think that you can stomach, the stomach violence. it. Or if you want to, like, you know, subject yourself to the endurance test of it, like, yeah, it's on Amazon. <laughs> um, not gonna not recommend it. Yeah, it's not a bad film no. by any stretch of the imagination. It's a very well made film. It's just like, it's rough. <laughs> it is really rough.
That, that, that was just like five minutes of qualifiers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, Brawl and Cell Block 99. It's on Amazon. If you got a stomach for it, it's there. Is that fair? Is that a good one? Fair. All right. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with our first time favorites of 2017 after this. Hey, Cinematariots. This is your co-host, Lydia Creech, with an important message during this break in the show. Cinematary would like you to know that we do not want your money, and we don't want to place ads in the show at this time either. That's not why we do this. We do it because we enjoy each other's company, and we want to bring you our pure, unadulterated opinions on the world of cinema. However, there are a few things you can do to help out the show that we would greatly appreciate. First, leave us a review on iTunes, four or five stars only. To help us reach more listeners, per the algorithm gods. Secondly, send us a tweet at Cinematary, or better yet, send us an email at Zach at Cinematary.com. That's Zach, Z-A-C-H, so we can hear from you guys for a change. I'd especially like to hear if you're a human and not an android who also likes Blade Runner, or maybe you have a suggestion of a movie you would really like to hear our opinions on. Regardless, let us know your thoughts, and we will read them out and respond to them on future episodes of the show. Finally, please share the show with friends and members of your family who you think would enjoy listening to and participating in our film discussions that we bring to you guys every week. So, to recap, review, send us your thoughts through Twitter and email, and please share with your friends and family. We would greatly appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Now back to the show. And welcome back to part two of episode 176 of Cinematary. In this part, we will be talking about some of our first-time favorites from 2017 uh andrew and i are gonna go um but real quick before we start did you uh andrew did you have any that you are not going to talk about in detail but were some of the ones that you caught from this past year that you enjoyed i do a couple honorable mentions i wanted to throw out some directors that i was slightly obsessed with this year that i watched multiple movies by um Zhang Yimao, the Chinese director, is one of them. I really loved his movie Hero, as well as his movie Raise the Red Lantern, which I really hope gets a blue release sometime soon. Um, in preparation for The Beguiled, I watched all of the Sofia Coppola films that I had not seen, uh, and she is certainly one of my favorite filmmakers at this point. Mary Antoinette was the highlight for me. Um, I also got... Uh, turned on to Makoto Shinkai, the Japanese anime filmmaker, at the end of last year and spent all of this year going through his filmography, even though some of his films are hard to track down. Um, His movie, Your Name, is probably going to be very, very high on my top ten this year, and I recommend pretty much all of his stuff unequivocally, except for The Children Who Chase Lost Voices, which is a terrible film. But... uh, Also, shout out to Jacques Demy. We've talked about Donkey Skin and Umbrellas and a lot of his films on this podcast. Uh, And uh, Michael Robinson, who Nathan got me turned on to, the avant-garde short uh, filmmaker who uses like pop culture uh, artifacts to make some really trippy stuff. The biggest film for me from him was uh, Light is Waiting, uh, which uses the full house uh, (laughs) episode where they drop the TV. Um, So those are the big ones for me. Zach, what do you got? I'll I'll tag on with you for the Jacques Demy uh, shout out. I've I've kind of I think I was I watched a little bit of his stuff before this year, but I really dug into a lot more of it uh, during the year. Um, another one is is somebody who I'll talk in, more in length about uh, is Yasuhiro Ozu. Ozu. Um, I watched a lot of his films this year. A big fan of his as well. This year that you started watching Ozu, I think it was. I watched earlier, them right? last year, but I dug into a lot of. I once once I was given access to Filmstruck, and I can just type in Ozu, and there's just like brah, everything. This was the year that Ozu became your aesthetic. <laughs> Ozu did become my aesthetic. That's pretty much. I, I, I all I do is seek out like a sake bar where I can just talk about sadness and sip on sake, like that's that's what I want. Um. It is. It's incredibly disappointed. Um, another one is uh, Jacques Tati. I think we, we watched Playtime last year, but I, I, I watched a lot of his other films uh, this year and kind of dug in more into him. I'm, I'm re- reading a book about him as well. Um, but some of the films that, you know, I, I have kind of stuck with me, ironically, they are some that we've talked about for, for the Cinematary. But Suspiria, I've watched a number of times this year and really enjoyed that. And just maybe this is like a recency bias, but I've been... 
thinking about these two a lot lately, and that is the Red Shoes and Black Narcissus. Um, specifically, to go back to uh, us discussing Star Wars The Last Jedi, Nathan, I don't know if you see this, but I want like a mashup of the fish nuns from The Last Jedi with the Black Narcissus nuns, oh my. <laughs> and I want a poster of that. So that's 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 I would like to see that at some point. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and start with with my picks. Uh, I mentioned Ozu. Uh, the the one I want to talk about with him is Floating Weeds, his 1959 film. Uh, it is a uh, kind of remake of a silent film that he made in 1934 called A Story of Floating Weeds. Um, but this one uh, it follows this this theater troupe, this Japanese theater troupe that returns that comes to this kind of small coastal town and is performing a show for a number of weeks and uh the the leader of it has has been to the town before and had a fling with a woman there and this is the first time that he's returned in a long time and so he goes to visit her and learns that uh he that he has a son well I, I, he didn't really learn that he has a son he he seems to have been have known the son but he's been kind of distant with him uh, they refer, he refers to him as his uncle for most of the t- most of the film, and he starts kind of uh, reconnecting with the woman and, and, and the son, while he has this uh, this this theater troupe there that is um, kind of dealing with their own drama in in various senses. There's there's uh, one of the female performers kind of latches on to to the to the to the man as this. Uh, kind of authorial figure you know very kind of patriarchal father figure that seems to attract her to him uh and she's kind of frustrated she's very frustrated with him that he is going off to you know reconnect with his past and uh spend time with the son um but this one is i feel like floating weeds is a little bit different than what um, most people think of with ozu it's 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 not as deeply entrenched in family as something like late spring or Tokyo story is. And it's, it has its light moments, but it's not nearly as light as good morning. Uh, it's a film that I think at first glance, the thing that struck with me most is just how radiant and beautiful this thing is. Um, it's, it's, it's easily his most subtle film in terms of, uh, in terms of cinematography, but he has a lot of these pillow shots where he will just leave the camera and and watch like an alleyway or watch the waves coming into the to the beach or watch someone walking down a street. Um, and there's something you you get these in a lot of Ozu's movies, but there's something so serene and somewhat mystical about floating weeds because in something like late spring or Tokyo story, you're in this, um, you know, metropolitan area, you're in this cosmopolitan, uh, space where there's, even though it's, it's older, there's still, um, technology and life and all of these things happening. And for floating weeds, you're in this small coastal town where it seems like most everybody knows each other. There's probably only like three different roads to get places, um, that confinement of of the the setting creates something much different than what um, you're used to with with some of the previous Ozu films, and I don't know it it that just that just being able to sit there with those images really um, really resonated with me. Um, something about just the simplicity, the minimalism of the shots but at the same time how intricate they they were i would uh i would recommend googling you know stills from floating weeds and seeing this one shot that he does where the the main the main character is on the outside of a building and the uh a female character is inside the building and it's raining and it it's this shot where they're separated by you know whatever the structure is but the structure's opened and the rain is like just pouring down in between them and it's just like this like perfect shot of 
you can see him clearly, you can see her clearly, but there's just this fuzziness of rain in between it that's just so... I, I It seems so simple how he would get that shot, but at the same time, when you watch it, it's kind of miraculous. It's that, you know, somebody somebody would be able to capture this that with just a, uh, you know, you know, a film camera, a 35 fil- uh, millimeter film camera, um, which is just remarkable. So that's that. That's kind of what my takeaway with Floating Weeds is. Is it's it's, it's this very simplistic, minimalist film, but it kind of highlights all of the the uh, strongest features of of what Ozu does best. And I think that it's one it's it's one that I I hope. If you start getting into Ozu, I think that it's one that to definitely check out because it has, it, it kind of works almost as a lexicon for um, digging into the like the vastness of his of his uh, filmography. Is this one of his black and white or color films? It's color. Nice, because uh, you showed me Good Morning by Ozu um, about a month or so ago when I was visiting, and I was really enamored with uh, just the. The, the detail of the, the furniture and the, the pastel colors of everything. Uh, just such a 180 degree turn from the bleak despair of Tokyo Story. Even though the, the emotions are still there, but there's so much life to the world. And so I'm, I would like to see that continue in Floating Weeds for sure. Yeah, there's, it, I, I love his, his black and white films like... Uh, like late spring and in Tokyo Story, but there's something there's something rich about his color films, whether it's Floating Weeds or The End of Summer or The Autumn Afternoon. Um, that I don't know, the color adds something to it. it, it it's 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 interesting. I don't I don't I don't think I can, uh, you know, nail down in, in a in a intelligent fashion like what what it does. But yeah, I would recommend I would recommend Floating Weeds to people. Um, Andrew, what is your first pick? Speaking of color, this brings me to my first film, which is Leave Her to Heaven, uh, 1945 uh, Technicolor film, uh, directed by John M. Stahl. I have no idea if John M. Stahl ended up doing any other films, but yeah, he did. did he? Yeah. What else he did you know for? He did the original version of uh, Imitation of Life, later remade by Douglas Sirk. Okay. Oh, cool. I'm not super familiar with the rest of his filmography, but I think it's pretty Mm-hmm. But in that kind of just like old Hollywood, just like work and work and work and way. Dylan pitched this movie to me on a previous episode of the podcast. I think it was over a year ago. Um, and his main takeaway from the movie is just how good uh, the star Gene Tierney is in the film. And that's kind of who I think of as almost the authorial voice of the movie, even though she probably wasn't. Um, But I watched this early on. It was in January or February, I think. Um, And it was part of a New Year's resolution to myself. I made a a commitment to watch American movies made before 1968 uh, because I watch a lot of older international cinema. But when it comes to like old Hollywood, like studio productions, that's a major blind spot in my film knowledge. So I've watched... Uh, I think over 40 over the course of the year, which is maybe not the most impressive number, but uh, Leave Her to Heaven was one of the early ones that I hit and uh, it stuck with me all year and really like kept me going through that, that ongoing project of just like seeking out stuff that I have no real context for and, and trying to gain a literacy to like what old studio movies were like. Um, and one of the reasons why it, it, was just like so inspiring for me to keep watching these movies is this movie just I mean it it does not feel old at all I mean I that feels almost um like naive or juvenile to say like I've been watching movies in a in a serious way for a long time I should not think of old studio films as old or boring um but I think there's always like more layers to peel back in terms of Uh, growing your familiarity with that stuff that's from a different time and a different culture. Um, This is about a a romance between uh, a woman played by Jean Tierney and a man played by Cornell Wilde, I believe, um, that starts very scandalous and illicit. I believe she is 
engaged and like cuts off her engagement to be with him. I don't remember a ton of details from either of my films, <laughs> unfortunately. You guys went into great detail. Lydia I, I was honestly having a hard time um, recalling some specifics. But <laughs> to me, like both of the movies that I'm going to talk about in this episode are movies that I just like feel this weird magnetic pull back to, even though I don't rec- remember all of the plot beats. There's just something about the, the feeling or the... Um, the energy of the movie, I guess, to, to be like new wave spiritualist about it. Um, Gene Tierney has, has this love for um, the, the male protagonist that escalates to a point of creepy obsession um, and becomes almost a horror movie by the end, but it's this like very slow building of like her being jealous of his attention and not wanting anybody else around him in a way that at first feels very, uh, you know, ordinary romantic relationship stuff where you kind of want to spend quality intimate time with your partner, but it becomes this like possessive, like domineering thing. Um, And the, the movie feels like a, cinematic response to the Charlotte Perkins Gilman story, The Yellow Wallpaper, um, be, because of the way that it's dealing with like um, confinement and relationships and things like that. But also, the thing that I think about, aside from Gene Tierney, when I think back at this movie, is like the wallpaper <laughs> uh, of the, the house that they are spending all of their time in. Um, this is a Technicolor film, as I said, um, and it is like a dazzling display of really really bright color um and if you want some like i mean i guess people look back at old hollywood and they think of it as being like you know bright like la la land-esque colors but it's hard to overstate just what this movie is doing in terms of just like popping out of the screen at you i would compare it to suspiria in that way it is like the old hollywood version of suspiria um but it, it also i don't know lo- looking back at the studio system there's a lot of directors that don't necessarily have name recognition anymore and so we uh, access them mostly through stars and familiar faces and it this movie i think plays really well with the idea of stars in the studio system uh just being these unreasonably attractive people like gene tierney is just you know you cannot fathom how gorgeous gene tierney is and the movie knows that you are feeling that while looking at her and like plays with the allure that that character has and kind of uh turns turns your allegiance in a couple different ways um and uh it's like i said it's a gorgeous movie to look at it is a shocking movie in terms of the turns and the the places that it goes, um, and feels very like bold and vicious, uh, even for a movie that would come out today, let alone a movie that came out in 1945. Um, so that was just like a really nice little mind blowing discovery early in the year for me that uh, m- made me feel very validated in this quest to like find um, movies that I would otherwise not be exposed to if I was intentionally trying to, to like root through some of this older stuff. So that's all I got. Leave her to leave her to heaven. The title is taken from a line from William Shakespeare's Hamlet. This is true. Yeah. Little fun, little fun fact we're we're both I looking at the Wikipedia sure. page right now. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that's something. All right, my my second pick is uh, is Nicholas Ray's film *In a Lonely Place*. It stars Humphrey Bogart, Gloria Graham. Uh, this one's interesting. I I, I was kind of um, caught off guard with how good this is. Um, it's a little bit as Jean Luc Godard once said, Nicholas Ray is the cinema. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, well, it, it's it's. It kind of feels a little bit like a um, deconstruction of pretty much every other Humphrey Bogart character. Uh, when you think about him, like in Casablanca or Maltese Falcon, he 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 has kind of a similar 
uh, you know, aloof, eerie quality to him, but he's generally vindicated in the end for, for why he acted that way. And in, in a lonely place, he definitely carries that same Humphrey Bogart quality, but it's it, it seems much more um, much more uh, it, it's ch- much more challenging of 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 just kind of being that aloof uh, you know lead character. He, he in, in this he plays a a screenwriter who. Uh, is at is at the bar one night and hits up a conversation with this uh, waitress, this this woman. I, I I can't remember if she was working there or not. Uh, but this woman at the at the bar, he takes her back to his place because he's talking about the screenplay he's, he's writing, and um, she's kind of taken with just his uh, intelligentsia, and I didn't use that word correctly, but it felt right. Um, <laughs> And uh, the next day, the police show up at his house, saying that uh, that she had been murdered. That, that uh, you know later that evening, and that he was the prime suspect because he was the last person that people saw her with. Um, and so he becomes entrapped in this in this whole you know murder mystery. And at the same time, he uh, begins to uh, court and have a relationship with the Gloria Graham character, who is his neighbor across the way from his apartment who you know sees him both entering his apartment uh with with the woman and then uh he see she sees him you know letting her out whenever she whenever she does leave um but of course it gets a little misty about what happens after that and um over the course of the film the gloria graham character is starting to become more and more suspicious of the uh uh, of of the Humphrey Bogart character's actions and, and his alliances and where he um, really was that night, you know, it, it, it's they kind of they begin this this love affair and then it, it slowly kind of erodes and erodes as as things you know begin to add up more and more. Um, but I, I I think it's kind of a similar thing with 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 what you said about leave uh, leave her to heaven where. It's this film that, of you know, came out in 1950, um, that kind of has this, you know, this, you know, film old film noir um, label to it, but I also find it to be, um, kind of, you know, very vast with with just all of the cinematic language it's using, but also just I think that this story works so tightly. It it, it of course has its um, abnormalities that that kind of make it you know preposterous a little bit but i i think i mean it's it's a movie of course it's going to be a little bit preposterous um and i love the uh i love just the the way that bogart kind of goes full into really going into that dark side of his image i don't i think that that's something impressive with you know a star of his of his stature you know, I, it's it seems like you know nowadays if if somebody's a, a quote star, they they try to kind of stay safe with their image. They don't want to go like too far to the to the to one side. They may ham it up and kind of you know uh, satirize what what their image you know may be. You know, like kind of like how, what Chris Hemsworth seems to be kind of doing whenever he takes on a comedic role or something like that or, or Tom Cruise and like a Tropic Thunder where he's kind of just playing a you know absurd version of of, of, a, of, of somebody that Tom Cruise would be playing but this one this one's different where it's he's a he's going you know the other direction he's going much darker and I don't know, it, 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 I think it's it's interesting to see an actor especially somebody like Humphrey Bogart who was this you know massive name in his time to be um to be to, to be following a story like this and, and be in, in to be going to the the lengths that he does he's he's a you know by the end of the movie um it's 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 tough to all you know it's 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 pretty impossible to align with him at all um and that's that's not something that whenever you think of the the roles of humphrey bogart that you're used to you, you, he's kind of a scoundrel but at the end of the day you still you still like him and that's definitely not the case for in a lonely place um so I would recommend this if you're if you're somebody 
if if you you know like film noirs, but also if you want to just explore, uh, like Andrew was saying, this kind of old Hollywood and and some of the uh, the films that uh, that see, that I feel like are instrumental that don't always get light shed you know shed on them as much as as some of the uh, the ones that 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 seem much more in the canon. Um, I would recommend in a lonely place. I think that it holds up uh, even now. Now we almost did a Nicholas Ray series instead of our Archer series. Um, in retrospect, how are you feeling about that decision? Would Nicholas Ray have been your preferred choice, or uh, do you think it was the right move to go with Palin Pressburger? Well, like I said last uh, in last in the in the episode when we finished up the Archers um, series, I really enjoyed it. So I, I was very happy we got to do that. But I would at the same time maybe next year we can we can circle back to Ray because I would like to to go through a lot of his films because this one really uh, really caught my eye. And there's still you know there's a couple of his other of his other uh, ones that that I would love to dig into. Um, so maybe next year for our director series we can we can circle back to him because he does have an interesting filmography. Do want. <laughs> all right well for my last film and i guess our last film of this quick two episode series um i want to talk about a film from 2015 or 2016 uh that i missed when it came out um that made a really big impression on me early on this year once again and that is a cemetery of splendor by a pitch pong where set the cool um thai filmmaker best known for uh, Uncle Boon Me, who can recall his past lives. I watched that movie um, a couple years back and just profoundly did not get it. Um, I was still very young to the, to the, um, the, the genre, if you, would, if you would call it that, of slow cinema. Uh, it felt to me like a museum installation, more so than a film, but now, looking back, I feel like I probably just wasn't engaging that movie on the right level. Um, I, I wasn't reading it right. Um, because Cemetery of Splendor um, really reframed the way that I think about this director, and really reframed the way I think about slow cinema in general, and has had a pretty significant impact on like, how, my tastes have, how my taste has changed over the course of this year. Um, in, in terms of plot, the movie is about um, a hospital of, is it war veterans? Yeah. War veterans who um, have some form of sleep sickness, whether it's narcolepsy or, or something else along those lines, where they're kind of uh, staying awake for very short periods throughout the day. And uh, when they are awake, they're kind of constantly uh, drifting back into uh, sleep and, and dream worlds. Um, and the movie focuses on the nurses that live that, that work in the hospital of these soldiers, um, and much of the movie deals with stories that are told between uh, the employees of the hospital and the the patients of the hospital. And there there are moments where, or long passages where, the dream worlds that these men are inhabiting are described in vivid detail, though we as the audience of the movie never actually see it. Um, and I, I have heard that some people have uh, been underwhelmed by the movie because it's it feels like a lot of talking at you and not a lot of visuals, but man, this movie does have visuals. Like, it does, it does not show you the, like, Guillermo del Toro, like, fantasy dream world that's being described, but the way that We're Sethical films uh, his environment, like, the natural beauty of his world is, like, really breathtaking. Um, and one of the, the things that unlocked his movies for me here... Um, was all of the images that he's giving you of different, like, oscillating things, like whether that be fans or escalators or things blowing in the wind or ripples on the water. You're just getting, like, all of these waves uh, that are uh, just spinning out into, um, uh, like... Un, untraceable places in a way that his movies are not concerned with plot or, or dialogue or 
you know, in, in a way, even thematics, it's more about just like getting across a mood and like mindset. Uh, his most recent project actually is a, I don't remember the name of it, um, but he, you can buy a, a hotel room uh, which he has decked out with psychedelic imagery and sleep in his uh, like 4D world that he has created for you. And this is this is a movie that almost dares you to fall asleep during it. Um, you're you're watching people sleep for long periods of time, and there's these gorgeous like neon. Uh, uh, oscillating lights that are like slowly fading from one end of the color spectrum to the other. Um, and it's very like lulling and uh, uh, meditative. There's a, a meditation instructor that shows up early on in this film and gives a bit of dialogue that kind of helps you unlock what the movie is trying to do. And I actually pulled up the quote, so I, w- I wanted to read it. It's on my letterbox review. He says, uh, Our problem is that we think too much all day, all night. At night, we call it dreaming. We all dream. We can't stop them. Thoughts are the same. Since we can't stop them, we must become more aware. Um, So the movie, for me, has really um, allowed me to reckon with, like, where my thoughts are when I'm watching movies. Like, am I being present and, like, experiencing the movie? Or are my thoughts, like, drifting drifting off and doing something else? I think A Pitch Fong Where a Cool is fine with either one. Like, in a way, movies uh, invite you to kind of imagine other worlds, whether that's, like, what's actually on screen or not. Um, but they are also, in a way, they are tests of your attention and tests of your patience. Um in in a, a world where we kind of in, ingest media in like tiny little bite-sized um, portions of you know twenty-minute episodes or you know uh, two-minute YouTube videos or whatever, uh, his movies like invite you to sit down and like force you to clear your head um, and achieve some sort sense of like almost Buddhist clarity in a way. Um, I don't think that I've had like. A movie that, you know, felt felt like some sort of spiritual experience, other than like the Tree of Life and Cemetery of Splendor is kind of doing a similar thing, but from a totally different worldview, totally different uh, like spiritual ideology. Um, so yeah, watch, watching this thing has um, given me more things to hunger for in other movies and allowed me to appreciate films that I might have found boring otherwise. Um, It's kind of like unlocked levels of patience, I guess. Uh, Which sounds like a real chore, but is actually, you know, kind of of liberating, kind of nice uh, to not... And I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm, I never get impatient watching movies anymore, but this is a movie that in my, in, reminds me not to. Um, and it's kind of like something to aspire towards. Zach? If you were going to you know, get into uh, slow cinema, would, would Cemetery of Splendor be a good starting point? Weirdly, maybe. Uh, it's kind of like jumping into the deep end and learning how to swim. Um, but no, it I, worked for me way better than Uncle Boon Me did. Nathan? I do feel like it's interesting, though, that like this worked for you so well just because, um, which this was also, I believe, my second of his movies. Mm-hmm. But it's like, it's, it's interesting. I mean, sometimes I think it's maybe more interesting kind of going backwards with the person's work than going forwards. Yeah. And you realize that, like, the woman, the central woman character in this film has been in most of his movies. Yeah. And, like, you see her, I guess she has, like, elephantitis. And, like, you see her leg, like, the, the condition of it worsen throughout his movies. But at the same time, I don't think, I think that context is very important. But I think, like you say, there are multiple ways of reading this. Like, there is this, I've seen it twice now, and there is this, like, political undercurrent to it that I didn't even realize was there like about like deforestation and and, and like kind of just like the erasure of history like there's yeah. a scene which I guess now has been cut out of the standard release version where they like the main characters go to a movie theater and they stand up for like in like that it's just quiet and you don't know why but it turns out that in every movie that's screened in Thailand, you have to stand up for the national anthem yeah. before the movie starts. And so they're standing up, but there's no national anthem playing. So I think it's kind of about this like 
absence of uh, like what I think was the there. version that I watched did not have that. Yeah, and I don't know. I've seen people like trying like talking about that and trying to figure out why it was cut out. I don't know if it was yeah. the distributor or a pitch upon himself or something. I don't know, but there is that kind of sense of like something has been buried and something has been lost. But I think at the same time it like really functions on that sensory level that yeah. you're talking about of like not just images but sound and of just this full experience. And I think maybe like for me, the way that his movies function is, you know, people say that somebody like David Lynch is like a filmmaker of dreams. Yeah. But I feel like for me, a Pichet Pong is this like hypnagogic filmmaker of like referring to like the space between waking and right. sleep, you know, like, and I don't know that's, and I think too, there's like this way of like, there's a shot in Cemetery of Splendor where it's like, it seems like you're looking at the sky, but then you realize you're looking at a reflection of the sky yeah. in the water. Yeah. And it's like, kind of like you're saying, inviting you to like s stare at a thing for so long that it becomes something different than what you thought it was. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, maybe if people don't want something as challenging as Cemetery of Splendor, but they want to give this guy's style a shot, I think that. Of the ones that I've seen, which are three, um, the most accessible is probably Syndromes in a Century, which has a, a really tight structure in terms of like the passage of time. You can you can mark the, uh, the the like chapters of the movie in a way, whereas Cemetery of Splendor is sort of drifting off aimlessly, and in a way that I think is also super valuable. Um, that might be a good stepping stone to this, but like if you're curious. Cemetery Splendors on Netflix. Yeah. Just give it a go. It's uh, it's an experience that you will, even if you don't like it, it 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 will be like no other movie you have seen. I think so. You know, give it a shot. Have a nice Saturday night with it. A slow Saturday. Slow Saturday. Slow Saturday. Coming, to Saturday. <laughs> coming yeah, co coming to your living room in 2018. Um, all right. Well, I believe that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter at, at cinematary, and on letterbox.com slash cinematary, where we post all the movies that we talked about in this episode. Next week, we will be putting up a bow on 2017 with our Cinematary Top 10 of 2017. Uh, it'll be a, it'll be an interesting list. We're still compiling it, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see what we can come up with, but it's. Definitely gonna have uh, be a source of discussion. I'll just say that. La La Land is on number one. Spoiler. <laughs> no, it's not La La Land. It's Blade Runner twenty forty nine. <laughs> it's like that. Uh, there's like that Onion article that comes out every time the Grammys happen, where it's like, and yet again, the record of the year is smooth. <laughs> <laughs> and just from now on, our number one of the year is gonna be La La Land. Every year. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for listening, and we will see you next week. <laughs>